Hi, this is Rick McCain, and I'm here with my beautiful wife, Brenda McCain, and we have a beautiful and wonderful young lady that we're interviewing today. Hey, baby, would you tell us about who this fantastic woman is? Oh, this fantastic, phenomenal lady is Wanda Christine. She has graced a small screen in many memorable guest starring roles and notable productions, such as Birdie on Chicago PD, Mrs. Jones in the hit dramedy, Me and Mrs. Jones, Spunk, The Vagina Monologue, Ooh, Blady, or is it Oh Blady? Touring company offenses. So we're gonna have a great time with her today, then. So we are gonna have a great time. So you know the McCains. We have a wonderful time talking to people, and so we just want to get a chance to know you and let our uh, audience know you as well. So. Are you ready for that? I am so ready. Come on, let's do it. All right, Come baby, on, you got a question for it because I'm off the cuff. Okay, well, we <laughs> gonna start it off with, it's all in the name. Tell us about that name, Wanda oh Christine. Oh, my gosh. Okay, when I was born, my father said, he took one look at me, and he said, he knew I was going to be different. So they gave me a different name. My grandmother's name was Christine. So there's probably about three of us that are named after my grandmother. When I became full equity, I decided I did not want to let any of my ex-husbands have uh, <laughs> any of that last name. So I decided to just use my whole first name. And so that's what I've always gone by. It's just Wanda Christine. I like that. Now, should I tell a man? Brenda Faye. Yeah. <laughs> well, the funny thing about it is, is that... Um, you just said that you didn't want any mm -mm. of your husbands to have... Mm -hmm. I've had a few. I've yeah, had okay. a few. I've so, had you know, you, you didn't want them to have what? <laughs> but I didn't want them to get a part of that name. Okay, so you want so to have that... the only time I put their name is on the taxes, okay. the passport, <laughs> the Illinois driver's license, and that's it. Okay. That's it. Everything else is just one to Christine. Wow, that's interesting. So, men, understand that, is that uh, we have women that are going to be starting to... Uh, void us out a little hey, bit hey, here. Hey, so. could do it. Why can't we? <laughs> hey, here you Come go. On, they now. not going to see this. Give me a high five. <laughs> ah, they <laughs> she can feel one it. Name. They can feel, they can it. feel, they feel it. it. They can feel mm -hmm. it. They can but, feel it. Okay, with that uniqueness in that name and all the stuff you have going on, mm -hmm. tell us who is the real Wanda Christine. Oh, my Lord. Jesus, help us. Oh, well, the real Wanda Christine has been an actress for mm, years. Uh, I'm what some of them would call a veteran actress, but I don't like using that term. I think of it as seasoned. Mm -hmm. uh, because there are so many of us that are still out here, still trying to work, and unfortunately we get pushed to the side when we talk about age. It's not just an age thing anymore, it's about female. So I am about being all that I can be, as powerful as I can be, and giving back as I can possibly be. Uh, so that, I guess, is who I am. I'm my mother's daughter. I'm my father's child. I'm my brother's sister. I'm my son's mama. And uh, and some aunts and cousins and godmama and all of that is rolled up into one. So that's who I am. You know, it's interesting that you say that because we are dealing with a situation right now where the older you get, sometimes people don't want to give you the, the roles that you are capable absolutely, of doing. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. We're going to talk about the role that you're playing soon, but talk a little bit about, you know, how that feels when you get to a point, because when you're told that you might not be able to do this role because of your age. And, and talk to some of the people out there that might be struggling with that situation you as know, well. You know, it's interesting that you, and especially coming from a, a man, mm -hmm. uh, I love that you asked that question because a lot of times when women ask it, we're asking from a vulnerable place. Yeah. Um, I lived in Hollywood for 10 years. I did uh, a couple of series. Uh, I starred on a couple of series as well. And it was, and it still is, a man's world. Unfortunately, once you get past that, you realize that, is it really worth it? Or do you want to move on to something else? Right. You have to be secure in yourself as a person. Forget about that you're a woman, because I already had two strikes against me. I was African American when I walked in the door, and then I'm also a woman. So the age thing didn't have anything to do with anything. Uh, even when I started out in the business, it was always about what color I was and the fact that I was a woman. I was, in fact, I was telling somebody a story not too long ago about uh, I was in my early 20s, and myself and another young man, we were casted to be in a commercial. It was a print ad 
for, let me just say, a, a mattress company. I'm not going to okay. say the name because I don't want to get you in trouble. <laughs> okay. And the agent had the prerogative to automatically cast us. So she sent our pictures to them and told us what time that we had to be on the shoot the next day. And she called early in the morning and said, I've got to tell you something. And I was like, what? She said, I hate to tell you this, but um, they're going to replace you guys because they said that black people do not sleep in the bed. So if we cannot use African Americans in this ad. From that moment, oh yeah, okay, don't pick your face up. Come on, man, pick it up. I don't know. I see it. I see it. All right. right. So from that moment on, I was on a mission that I was never ever going to let somebody tell me that I couldn't do or be in something because of the color of my skin. Yeah, that's great. That was that was a sty in the eye, but it also propelled me to tell that story continuously because I still look on television and I look at that ad. And I still don't see any black people in those ads. Yeah. Uh, it's not just us. There are Asian people that sleep in the bed. Mm-hmm. There are Latino people that sleep in the bed. There are all kind of people that sleep in the bed. So why do I still have to carry that in my brain to say to myself, I am never, ever going to let someone say to me, I cannot do or be something because of who you think I am. You know, that's powerful, and it, and it's, it speaks a lot to young African-American males Absolutely. and females to understand that you should never have a defeated attitude never. that you can't do anything. And even though in some cases, you know, someone may tell you no, I used to always say, when someone tells you no, go to the person that can give you a yes. And you keep on until they do give you yeah. a yes. Yeah. And, and it's awesome that you say it though. I'm just mesmerized by it, so I'm like, okay. Oh, that's that that ahead. that's just that's just one of the many stories that I went through here in Chicago. And even in Los Angeles it's a lot more racist within the business than Chicago is. Uh, so I think that my upbringing in Chatham and okay. all the places that I frequented as a teenager and even as I became an actress, the support system that I had, even from other actors in this business, from Jackie Taylor, Ernest Perry, Chuck Smith, uh, the names can go on and on and on. Douglas Alleman, who's no longer with us, that started Chicago Theatre Company on the South Side. Uh, I could just name off forever and a day, but those are the people, Jonathan Wilson, um, those are the people that inspired within me the fire to give back. And I used to charge young actors when they would come to me to work with them on their uh, monologues and even their voiceover tapes. And then a couple of years ago, I decided not to charge anymore because I realized that They needed to have someone that they could call or talk to when you have those moments of, okay, what do I do? I feel like I'm being disrespected. I feel like I should have asked for more. I feel like maybe I shouldn't have done this, or maybe do you think I should wear this, or whatever. They need somebody to talk to where an agent is not going to give them that. They need somebody that's already in the business that's going to say, no, no, did you feel like you needed to go on that audition? Well, Well, then you don't go. It's not about giving somebody that 10%. It's about how do you feel about giving them that 10% right. because they are working for you. Mm-hmm. So because of that, I don't charge anymore. No more. You've been listening to an interview with Wanda Christine, who is going to be doing a six-character play at the American Blues Theater. This is Rick McCain along with Brenda McCain. Now back to the interview with Wanda Christine. So, uh, Wanda, Christina, what we want to do, we want to let everybody know about the wonderful play that you're going to be in soon, but we want them to understand a little bit more about you first so they can get a chance to see this awesome young lady. So, I know my baby's got a couple of more questions for her. What do you got uh, on that question that you always have together? <laughs> I like the backstory. Okay. So, I want to know, because you answered part of that question, but I want to know... When did you decide you wanted to become an actress? When my first husband walked out and left me with a child. Oh, wow. (laughs) (laughs) She hit us hard. Boom. Okay. We had had known each other since grammar school, and uh, we got married too young, and 
I had what I thought was a slight little nervous breakdown. And one of my best friends, we had gone to high school together. And she belonged to a theater company called Dramatic Art Guild. And they were out of a hospital uh, that no longer exists, Michael Reese Hospital. And uh, that's where I met Chuck Smith and a couple of other people because we all started out together. And uh, she wanted me to get involved with some people to just come out of my shell. And I said, oh, okay. And at the time, I was going to, to school to be a court reporter. And I had maybe like about four more weeks before I was going to take the state exam. And she took me to a cast party. And people were drinking and dancing and doing all kinds of things that they were doing back in the 70s. And I was like, "Woo! where am I? Lordy, Miss Claudie. And the next thing I knew, I was taking a class in acting. I went to, I went back to the co-reporting school. I had the machine in my lap, and as they passed around the little exam, I looked at the exam, and I thought about it, and I said, this is not what I want to do. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew that wasn't it. I threw the machine literally up in the air, and I said, I'm going to walk out of here and do what I want. I walked out. My parents thought I had lost my mind because I had a child. And he was only about two at the time. So I decided to go to uh, what was called Luke College at the time, which is now Harold Washington. And my mentor was Sidney Daniels, who worked with a lot of uh, actors here. He died just last year. Um, he was very instrumental. He, uh, in fact, his girlfriend at the time was also involved in advertising. And she hired me to do voiceover work. Next thing I knew, I was singing on jingles, and I was doing voiceover work. Um, and when my ex-husband and I split up, I started dating Robert Guillaume, because he was here at the time doing Pearly. Oh, wow. And this was right before Benson. Oh, yeah, girl. <laughs> Mama didn't play. Robert Guillaume. Okay. And so he, he was very instrumental in uh, giving me a lot of support uh, as far as taking classes, so I uh, auditioned for uh, a scholarship at Loyola University. They gave me a full run. There were only two of us that were uh, African Americans in the theater department at that time on scholarship. I went through musical training there. I went to the Conservatory of, Conservatory of Music. I studied my ass off to, to do whatever. And I learned everything there was to learn about this business. I, I knew how to sew. So at the time, uh, Sidney Daniels, uh, he used to make us write, uh, do our own costumes. We had to learn how to build a set. You had to direct. You had to learn how to hang lights. You had to know every aspect there was in theater before you could move on. So I knew how to do all of that before I got to Loyola. So once I got to Loyola, it was like, this is nothing. This is nothing. You kids are complaining, please. Let me take you back. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and one of the good things you was talking about is that uh, you knew that what you were about to do wasn't something you wanted to do. Right. Speak a little bit up to some of the people out there, because you got some young kids out there that still don't oh know what they're gosh. doing. Not wasting their time pursuing something that they don't want to do, but finding something that they enjoy doing. The one thing that I tell a lot of my students when they come to me is first of all, you have to be passionate. It has to be in the core of your soul. It's not so much about somebody saying to you, oh, you know what, you sound good. You, you could be a voiceover person. Or you know what, uh, my cousin said uh, I could be in that play. You know, the one that they were doing down at the road. You know, I could do that. No, no, baby. Can you read? Do you? That's the first thing. Can you read? Because that is the most important thing so many of them start out and they do not have the skills. If you can at least learn to read, that's the beginning. And then you have to want it. You have to want it more than anything in the world because it's not going to be all that glamour that you see on television all the time. The people that are making it, the, the ones that have been around for a long time, they had a lot of dues to pay before they got to who they are and where they are. It just didn't happen overnight. Sometimes, oh yeah, it does. But believe me, when you get that path and it happens that fast, it can take away. That's just that fast. Because that role's not going to be there forever. Then what are you going to do? Seinfeld, yeah, that, that show is, is still in reruns. Yeah, but what is he doing right now? Right now. You know, he's he's got a lot of money, but there's so 
something about, I'm sure that he would like to, you know what, I think I'd like to go back and do some stand-up, or, or maybe I'd like to do, or maybe I'd like to, yeah. mm-mm. So one thing I do like about what you're saying, Wanda Christine, is for the young people out there, know your craft. You have learn to. Your you craft. have to like learn the said, craft. The core, it should be the passion. It the has habit. to be. A lot of people do think now it's a one hit one. I get that lucky mm. roll, like you said. Right. It don't work that way. And mm-hmm. that, since Rick and I've been doing play reviews, we respect the craft. I enjoy looking at actors and actresses up there because it's a lot you go through. And it's it's a lot. Alive. And people don't realize that when you see us, I, I enjoy theater a lot more than I do on camera and being on a TV series. The money is great for on camera and doing a series, but there's something about taking a writer's words and making it come to life, and every night it's going to be different. It's not going to be the same thing. You're going to get an audience. Sometimes you're going to get those that are... <laughs> sitting there falling like, yeah. It's my job to make... Hey, hey, hey! Wake up. Wake up, baby. I'm working up here. You got... Wake up. Come on. When we learn those lines, people don't realize that it takes time to absorb the story. You're not just learning some words on a piece of paper. You're learning a character. You're learning a walk. You're learning how that person talks. You're learning how that person relates to maybe the other characters on stage. There's a lot that goes behind all that. And you have to be able to take direction. If you can't take direction and you're not, and you have a thin skin and you know that you don't take direction well and criticism, then this is not for you. Yeah. This is absolutely not for you because it's not going to be an easy walk. One of the things that I really enjoy about theater more than on television, mm-hmm. one, there is no cut. You got to know those lines and the purity of knowing those lines and knowing exactly when to say something yes. when you have to follow the other person. Yes. Having that purity on there where that person is really knowing what they're doing. They know their craft so much so that they are in sync with everybody else. You it, have it, it's to. It's powerful. Because somebody is going to mess up. Yeah. It's, it's just inevitable. Somebody is going to... They, they will look at you with those eyes like, oh, <laughs> oh, I need some help. Yeah. <laughs> but if you're really good, though, which I know you are on stage, the audience never know they when never you guys know. mess yeah. up. We just never. go with the flow. Never. And if you mess enough, kick it right we on up. We just pick it right stop. back up and just keep on. You, you, you can tell when another actor is in trouble. And you do whatever you can to bring them back. Sometimes you can't. And you just have to keep moving on. But if you can bring them back and get them to a place where they can pick up, then that's all you can do. Mm-hmm. And like you say, the audience never knows, but we do. Right. And when we walk off, stage, I can't believe I messed up that line. <laughs> and the stage manager is waiting for you in the way. Do you know you messed that line up? I know. Okay, exactly. And you're sitting there going, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I think that's why I, I admire August Wilson. As a writer, he writes so lyrically, but to learn August Wilson is not an easy task at all. Everybody that has ever done an August Wilson play will tell you that you spin your mind like this with your hands up to your head going, okay, August, I'm there with you. Because people don't naturally talk the way that he writes. And so you have to find that part of you that's saying, okay, I've got to disconnect this and connect to this. And that's the same way with the the piece that I'm doing now, Dale Oleander Smith, brilliant writer. She is a fabulous writer. And in fact, she started out doing a lot of one-woman shows because no one was hiring her as an actress because of the way she looked. Uh, She's a tall woman. Uh, she's a lot bigger than I am. Um, I'm a little bitty thing. So to embody her work, this is going to take an audience on a totally different ride. Because this play, she wrote this play back in the early 90s. Um, and she is also a poet. She writes using a lot of spoken word. But she is very clear in the way that she writes. She has won awards for her writing. Um, she's very... It's not so much that, I don't want to say down to earth because that does not even begin to describe who this woman is. I have such respect for her, not just as an artist, but as a woman to be able to take the chances that she has has taken 
with her writing and saying, take it as it is because this is who I am. She's You've been listening to an interview with Wanda Christine, who is going to be doing a six character play at the American Blues Theater. This is Rick McCain, along with Brenda McCain. Now back to the interview with Wanda Christine. Uh, all of her one woman shows are basically characters that either have influenced her or they're characters that she's met or they're characters that she knows, but they're all characters that have a, have a purpose to the story. This story, called Beauty's Daughter, has six characters. Do you play all oh, six characters? Oh, I'm by myself. <laughs> I've done solo shows before, but they've always been my show. So this is the first time I'm doing someone else's uh, wow. show, so I want to be true to her, to the core. I was given this script two years ago almost as a birthday present. I think of it as a birthday present. When, when they said, uh, Wendy Whiteside of American Blues Theatre Company sent me an email saying, was I familiar with uh, Beauty's Daughter? And I said, no, why are you having auditions for this? And I went online and read about it. She said, no, we're not having auditions for it. We'd like to offer it to you. Oh my <laughs> okay. I read it and automatically I said, Oh, this is this is this is this I was so tongue tied, but at the same time I felt so humbled and so flattered by them because it's it's uh, an amazing piece of work. She takes us through East Harlem to meet six characters. One is, the, fir the first one is a young man who is graduating from high school, and he's Puerto Rican, and he's trying to help take care of his family before he can even think about going away to, to college. He's already been accepted, but at the same time, his whole thing is, yo, diet, I gotta look after my moms and sisters, you know what I'm saying? And then you've got another character who is based on a guy who used to play with Howlin' Wolf. And he's no longer a, a blues guy anymore. And he's, he's lost his, his, his self-worth. And you know as a black man, when a black man loses his self-worth, it's like, where does he go? Yeah. Who does he become? How does he survive? Who is he? This character for me was probably the most gut-wrenching because to even embody his his body and I'm not going to tell you other things about him because I want you to be surprised when you come to the show but there's something about him that he has to survive on the streets and the only way he survives on the streets is by listening to the to the 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 shoes that pass by he can tell a lot about a person by their shoes he can tell how a man walks he could tell if it's a man, he could tell if it's a woman. Shoes tell a whole story about a person. So I'm going to stop you for a second, because you just told me about two male roles. Mm -hmm. And you are a female. Thank you. So now, how do you... <laughs> oh, female. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, Brenda. But I want to ask you this, you know, how do you channel so much the male persona that I'm going to be able to see or envision that I'm actually looking at a man. As an artist, I look at people all the time. I don't have a car. Since I moved back from LA, I sold my car for a reason. I enjoy riding on the cream and green, as we call it, uh, <laughs> because there are so many stories on there. Mm -hmm. There are so many stories. There are so many people that are in their private worlds, but I enjoy kind of peeping in just to see, to understand, what is this brother going through? He's sitting in a certain way because maybe he doesn't have any money. Or maybe this brother's sitting a certain way because he's on his way to a job interview. Or this brother's sitting a certain way because he just broke up with his girlfriend. Or maybe this brother's sitting a certain way because he's talking to two women at the same time. Then I move along and I look at the women and I look at the shoes of the women. Because the shoes of a woman can tell you a lot about a woman. If they're high, if they're low, if they're scuffed, if she spent more on her shoes than she did on her clothes, or more on her than she did on her paying her rent, or 
everything else is going on in her life. The shoes in the purse. The shoes in the purse. <laughs> That tells the story. Yeah. Then I move on to the children. I move on to the kids. I move on to see how they are respecting or disrespecting as they're sitting on the bus. Because they, they tell a story, too. Then I move on to when I'm on the train or I'm in the L station. There's a lot of stories there. So I encompass all of those, and then I bring them to whoever it is that I'm playing or portraying on stage. So with this, she had specific people in mind when she wrote that. So I couldn't take too much from my own imagination. I wanted to be true to who she wrote these characters to be. The great thing is I never saw the play done. I didn't see her do it. So I've got to use my own imagination. But because I've lived with this script for over two years, I know, I have an idea as to who these people are. To the point that now when I sleep, I'm saying the, the words in my sleep now because their dialogue has become my dialogue. The way they move has become a part of the way, sometimes the way I move. Um, there's another character who is an older woman. She's in her 80s. And she's uh, spending a lot of time talking to her husband who's no longer with her. But she finds comfort in talking to him. And she says something so profound that when you look at a picture, and it's a picture of someone that is deceased, that's no longer around. You look at that picture long enough, you feel like that person is right there with the person that you're talking to. Because we got to remember that it's about feeling. Feeling things. And she's into the blues. <laughs> oh my gosh. The blues play a magnificent part in this entire piece. Because Dale was into blues, rock and roll and jazz and she writes a poem about jazz when she meets another male character who's Italian Now that was probably the the most uh, Artist. It, it wasn't hard but it was probably uh, I would say the most interesting the most interesting character for me simply because to hear an Italian guy hit on an African-American woman, he's got a whole different kind of rap. And so he's trying to hit on hit on the main character, and she's coming back, and they're sparring back and forth. I like that. I like that, because we don't get a chance to like get into that world too often to peek. Sure, we do when we're experiencing it, but for me to play a man to try to spar with and to get him to get his face tightened by a woman, that was fun. Yeah. You know, it's a, I know you want I, I can talk all the time, but I know it's hard enough to just to portray one role. Now you're almost in a schizophrenic kind of philosophy here of playing six different six people. people. And poetry too, come you know, on now. And that I mean that is amazing uh, that you can do that. And so this must this is gonna be something amazing to see. The uh, the awesome talent that you have that you can you know even partake in something like that. Well, you that. have to remember, I have an awesome director, yeah. Ryan O.J. Parson, who is known around Chicago, but also regionally and outside of the region as well. He is an actor, but he's also an actor's director. And we worked together before uh, up at Writer's Theater. We did Old Settler together. Okay. And working with him before we would go to work, we would ride the train in together uh, on the Metro, and he would tell me stories, and I would laugh my ass off so much that I thought I was going to just cry before we would even get into rehearsals. So he set it up to such a degree that we have such a great uh, collaborative relationship that he keeps telling me, what do you want? How do you see that? How do you want to do that? Okay, do you want that piece? Okay, what kind of costume do you think you want? Okay, how do you want to wear your hair? I've never had a director give me that kind of respect before, especially a male director. Because trust me, there are a lot of male directors, theater, on screen, off screen, in the booth, out the booth, that will intimidate a woman to no degree. And if you don't know how to stand up for yourself or at least feel as though you can still survive it mm -hmm. without saying, I'm going to go tail on you, because even if you go and tell on somebody, that, what does that solve? Yeah. Nothing. Because there's a, when you get rid of that one, there's always going to be another one. 
<laughs> so before we go on again, just tell us about again about the name of the play and where it's going to be. Beauty's at. Daughter at Stage Seven Thirty Three. Produced by American Blues Theater Company. You can go to www.americanbluestheater.com and find out more information. Or you can even go to my website at www.wandachristine.com. Okay, when does the play start? The play starts on July the 7th is our first preview. And we close... No, no! (laughs) August the 5th... No! You never know. It might get extended. Hey, <laughs> come on out, people. Yeah. People, come out. I think I think that doing this piece doesn't just mean to me about the characters. It also means what we were talking about before, about women. This piece was written for someone much younger. So you, gotta, you have to just dispel your imagination and say, oh, okay. But age is never mentioned. Are you okay? Age is never mentioned, but you kind of get the feeling that, well, is it or is she or what? It's up to me to suspend all of that so that you don't even think about that. I don't want people to even be sitting there thinking, okay, she's black. Okay, no, she's a man. Okay, she's not. Okay, wait, don't matter. I don't want anybody to be thinking any of those things when they're sitting there. It's my job to make sure that everybody gets on that same ride with me from the time I open my mouth until the time it's all over. Now, you know, that's going to be an amazing task for you to do. When you can get someone, I'm not saying you can't do it, (laughs) but when you can get someone to see the character that you're trying to get them to envision, Mm -hmm. then you and yourself become invisible. And that's what most actors and actors want. They want them to, to... to see the, that individual, I, if I want, if I'm mean, I want you mm-hmm. to, you want to hate me, mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. to do that is mm-hmm. hard. Absolutely, for one character, mm-hmm. one. Mm-hmm. But you're about to do this for six, six, without mm-hmm. any wardrobe changes. No wardrobe changes. I will have like little pieces of a little thing here or there, but for the most part, it's just me, my body, and you. That's gonna be amazing. <laughs> <to see. laughs> Wonder Christine is that good to pull this off, Rick? Let's talk about those nominations for Best Actress, Best Supporting Actress, because this might be another nod for them. I, you know, I look at, I'm not going to say that I don't want it. I'm not going to even say that. I'm just going to say that I've been around long enough that I feel as though, as long as I woke up this morning, that's one reward. As long as I can remember all those lines, that's two rewards. As long as I'm still able to do what it is that I enjoy doing, that's three rewards. I could go on and on and on. Those are the rewards that mean more to me. I don't want to say more than just having a stag. Yeah, I, I want a Tony. I watched those Tonys last night and said, yes, 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 you're waiting on me. I know you are. I feel like we don't get acknowledged enough for our work. Uh, one of the reasons that I also became an author was because I felt that I cannot complain if I'm not going to be a part of a solution. So I, when my dad, right before my dad died, the last thing he said to me was, I want you to write a book. I said, write a book? I don't write no books. Okay, okay, daddy, okay. I had no idea what he was talking about. I had no idea. The next thing I knew, I moved to L.A. right after my father passed. And uh, before I left, I kept thinking, okay, I got to write this book. I got to write this book. But I don't, I don't know what the book is about. I don't know what the book is about. Then I came back to Chicago because my mother-in-law was dying. And we had just buried my sister. So I came back to basically deal with family more so than anything else. I wasn't thinking about acting. I was thinking about family. So I kept thinking and thinking, what will, I, what will I write about? What will I write about? So someone from a church that I was attending back in L.A. told me about a group called Nano Writers, And they challenge you to write a book in 30 days. Wow. And you start November the 1st and you end at the end of November. So I was like, okay, I, I, I think I could do this. The next thing I knew, I was writing about all the things that had happened in L.A., but I turned them into other people. 
So I spent every day I was writing, I was writing, I was writing, I was writing. So uh, originally the name of the book was, because my father used to always say this to me, he always wanted to know what happened to our headshots after we came from auditions. What do they do with them? Do they keep them? Do they throw darts on them? Do they give them back to you? What do they do with them? I said, oh, daddy, I don't know what they do. They probably just, you know, throw them away. He said, well, girly, are you sure Betty Davis started like this? So that was the name of my book, Girly, Are You Sure Betty Davis Started Like This? Okay. But then the Betty Davis estate came along, <laughs> and they loved the idea, but they wanted some ducats. And I said, okay, all right, this will work, but let me think, because I'm thinking beyond that. I'm thinking TV series, I'm thinking movie, I'm thinking a play, I'm thinking all kind of stuff. I'll be paying Betty Davis forever and a day. Yeah. So... My agent said, well, what is it that you always say to us whenever you're up here? I say, I love you guys more than shoes. Well, there you go. And that's where the <laughs> title came from, I Love You More Than Shoes. So the book is basically, I, so I sat down and wrote this book about four actresses over 50 still trying to make it in Hollywood because I knew what that was like. I had experienced it. And nobody has talked about really what it's like for African-American actresses over 50 still trying to work. They don't have health insurance if they didn't work long enough to be in, in the union to be vested. They don't have what we would call any kind of security as far as pension because they didn't work enough to get SAG or after pension. Uh, some of them, after a while, their health, health challenges, they just decided they couldn't do it anymore. So what happens to them? They just sit off to the side and say, I don't want to do this anymore because nobody do, nobody wants to hire us. So I wanted to write about those women that have those feelings, but at the same time, they're still working. So one of those characters is a stunt car driver, a stunt woman. One of them was a, a Broadway diva that decided to move to L.A. and became Tina the Talking Turkey on a PBS series. Another one has a boyfriend, yes, who has ducats, and he's uh, quite wealthy, but she has her own money because she is a Chopomatic queen, a late-night Chopomatic queen. You know those infomercials where they yeah. sell those knives? That's what she does. And then the other one is just a lost soul still trying to make it. So encompassing all those women... That's how I feel about what's happening today. So when I get on that stage to do Beauty's Daughter, mm -hmm. those are the women that I'm representing because those are the women that still deserve to have a voice. So let me ask you that in that, in that vein, we were talking about the Beauty's Daughter at the uh, American yes. Blues Theater with Wanda Christine. Why what, should I want to go see this play? Because you want to come and have an adventure for at least 90 minutes to forget about what's going on out there. You want to forget about all the politics. You want to laugh. You want to shed a few tears. You want to see your uncle up there. You want to see your auntie. You might even see your mama. Everybody's, you may see your girlfriend. Everybody's going to see somebody that they know up on that stage in one of those characters. So hopefully it's when, I'm, when it's over, somehow it's going to speak to me. What are you trying to get overall to say to someone when the play is over? What is Beauty's Daughters, when I leave, what is this going to say to me? That there is life. You got to live. One of the characters says, live. Live. Do not be afraid of feeling things because you got to feel things in order to live. And that's all I want you to do when you walk out. I want that music that's going to end when that light goes off and I take that final bow, the music that's going to come up, it's going to make you say, ah, yeah, all right now. Because I want people to still feel good. I want you to still remember that, yes, there's a lot of stuff going on out here. A lot of stuff going on. We're worried about babies getting shot by other babies. We're worried about how somebody's going to buy some food to be able to feed that baby. We're worried about health care. We're worried about so many things that we haven't had a chance to laugh. We haven't had a chance to really enjoy our lives. And that's the way it used to be back in the days when it was the Depression. People found money to go to the movies. They found money to be entertained. We as a people, we entertained ourselves with, with the blues. That's where the blues came from. Feeling blue. 
Okay, that's what it's about. When you listen to to our gospel songs, what are we singing about? Hey, please help us through this day. How can I make it through another day? Thank you, Jesus. I'm here. I'm alive. That's what I want people to feel when they walk out of there, that they had 90 minutes of saying, thank you. 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 And there will be life after August 5th. <laughs> Please tell your mama, tell your daddy, tell your auntie, bring your family reunion groups. There you go. All of you. Everybody, Come down, yeah. every, everybody, as we everybody. all say, everybody. But before we wrap this up, I just have a few questions for you. What was, what is one of your most memorable characters you like to play? Oh Jesus, Vince's. When uh, Jonathan Wilson, I was not going to do that show. In fact, I just told you when I moved back to Chicago, I was here to basically look out for family members. And so the only acting I did was voiceover because I was making enough money from that to sustain myself and to say, okay, I'm happy to just go in the booth, sell a product, or help somebody get elected, and we'll move on from that. So one of my friends came to me and asked me to uh, be the other actor for him in the audition because they were putting him on tape. And it was a touring company of Vince's. And I said, oh, okay, I'll go in and read with you. So I went in and I read with him. And the person that was directing it was Jonathan Wilson, who was also a part of Loyola University, who was one of my teachers way back in the day. So I was like, oh, Jonathan's directing this. Hmm, okay. So my agent said, you should audition. I said, no, I'm not auditioning. So after my friend auditioned, uh, a couple of days later, my agent said, we really think you should audition. And I kept saying, okay, you know what? I'm going to just put everybody out their misery, and I'm just going to go down here and audition. So I went through the script, and he had already made up his mind who he was casting, so it was basically casting. So he came to the uh, office only because they told him that I wanted to be put on tape to be considered. And he's like, yeah, okay. All right. If it's Wanda Christine, yeah, okay. I'm okay. All right. So he came down, and uh, right before the audition, he told me, he said, I just want you to know that I've already casted. I've already let New York know. And I just want you to be on tape just so that they could see you, see your work. And I was like, mm-hmm. I had that look at my face like, mm-hmm, that's what you think, mm-hmm. So, after the audition, and it's that scene, if anybody is, is familiar with Vince, it's that scene where Troy tells Rose that uh, he's got this baby coming, and she's like, wait a minute, oh no, that was the scene. So, after I finished doing the scene, he said to me, he came over and he hugged me and he said, can you be on the road for over six months? I said, hallelujah. <laughs> and that was it. So once I left to do the show, I was with some incredible guys. Oh my gosh. In fact, one of them just got through doing Jitney in New York. Uh, I was surprised he didn't get a Tony nomination. Brilliant. I was with some brilliant guys. Absolutely brilliant. They treated me like I was Queen Molly Molly. Uh, things happened, people got sick, we saw people die, um, family members back here died, things like that, but we couldn't leave because none of us had understudies. So I remember the, the last city where we were working, I called Jonathan just as I was walking back to my dressing room, and he was still he was back here in Chicago. I said, Jonathan! I said, yeah, babe, what's up? Uh, you know today is the last show, right? I said, yeah, babe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you okay? Is something wrong? Something wrong? Uh, is there any way we can get the show extended? <laughs> he said, what? Uh, I'm not ready to come back yet. <laughs> oh, no, baby. The show's got to end. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Rose had just that whole experience. It was probably one of the most, uh, one of the many uh, experiences that I've had that will stay with me for the rest of my life. For so the rest with, of my life. So with all those roles that you've played, how has that prepared you for this role that you're playing uh, for Beauty's Door? The discipline, the discipline, first of all, because it's just me. Mm -hmm. 
I have nobody else to depend on. Well, that's interesting because you don't. I mean, if I you forget a line, if it's you forget a line, and, it's like it's just me and Jesus. You can't ask the other person, cue me. I just told you, me and Jesus. Okay. Hello. <laughs> that's it. I, I feel like um, everything that I've gone through, because even one of my girlfriends told me that when I wrote the book, that I shouldn't look at it as. Um, those were all terrible things that happened to me in the past that I had to look at it as these are lessons that I had to pass on to someone else so that they can learn from that. So I've learned from everything that I've gone through as an actress to be able to get up on that stage now and to play that this role and say, wow, Wanda Christine, I'm really kind of proud of you. Yeah, okay. In fact, uh, in the program, I dedicated my uh, performance to my mother because I'm also her uh, caregiver. And to me, she instilled everything of who I am. See, I'm trying not to cry. Everything of who I am was from everything that my family made sure that this is who I continue to be. And that means a lot to me. That means an awful lot to me. So that's why I say when I step up on that stage, I'm not just bringing Wanda Christine. I'm bringing all my ancestors. I'm bringing my grandmama. I'm bringing my father, my brother that passed away a couple of years ago. I'm bringing all the angels of actors that have passed. All of them that have supported me on their shoulders. That's what this. That's what this is. So do they, in essence, become Beauty's daughter? Yeah, that they do. That in yeah, that, yeah, they do because I believe that that's what Dale did when she wrote this piece. Mm-hmm. I believe that all that all of those ghosts and all of the the good things, the bad things, all of the people that she knew when she was in Harlem, all of those experiences that she's written through her poetry and even in the dialogue with the characters, I believe that those people somehow or another, I don't believe that things just happen. I think that they happen for a reason. This role was not given to me just by a coincidence. I believe that there was a reason for all of this. So as I have learned this and now I'm ready to do it, I'm ready to experience whatever it is that I'm supposed to just throw out there. Because I'm going to be having the same good time with you guys as everybody else. Because it ain't nobody else but me up there. That's true. So we just got uh, just one or few couple more questions. Uh, We're going to edit it and everything like that. And you probably won't hear the background noise with that either. Uh, Baby, you got a couple, one or two more questions? Yeah. So so in all of her, I I need to know one fun fact about Wanda Christine that I want our loyal listeners and readers to hear. Oh my God. You're going to think this is crazy. I am a huge law and order fan. Oh wow, so are we. We <laughs> watch it too. Okay, all the I time. watch it all day. Monday, yeah. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, yeah. Friday. It's on Ion and, and, and We Channel. I yeah. at the same time I want I know every episode, the dialogue, okay. all of it. And one time, um, the guy that plays Detective Green was on uh, Rachel Ray's show. And she was saying, she was talking about the theme song. Mm-hmm. And he said, oh, yeah, you know, we got a little a little ditty that we sing with it. And she was like, well, what is it? And he said, law and order is on. Law and order is always on. Law and order is on. I was like, yeah! <laughs> so whenever I, I'm depressed, yeah. I know it sounds crazy, but it's something about that show yeah. that I just, and they have tried to, you know, reproduce it with, I, I love me some Dick Wolf, you know, and I know he's got, brought us some work here in Chicago, but it's something about the grittiness. The grittiness, yeah. The grittiness yeah. of that show being shot in New York. And it just wasn't always about us being shot and killed. and You know what I'm saying? There were African Americans that were on there that did something other than commit crime. I want to see us have those type of shows again. I don't want to see a brother shooting somebody all the time. I want to see a brother that's an attorney or a sister that's an attorney. Or let there be social workers or let there be drama teachers or something. But everything cannot be about the gun. It just can't. 
It can't. So I know it sounds crazy to watch a show that's about violence, but there's something about, there's always a redeeming factor right. yeah. in that show. There's a message. Sam Waterstone is always trying to bring about some kind of message in, in every everybody that he prosecutes. So, yeah, that's my point. I'm going to use this as, um, so we're talking about uh, uh, Beauty's Daughter. Mm -hmm. What is the message in this? That you have to be supportive. You have to always be there for someone who is in trouble. You have to. You have to remember who you are, whose you are, and where you came from. Having a certain amount of humanity. There you go. Yeah. There you go. And so we're uh, talking with uh, Wanda Christina here. She's going to be in Beauty's Daughter, which is going to be in the American Blues Theater. When is that coming out again? It's at stage 733. That the address is... One two two five West Belmont. Uh, See, I let I let our rep from American Blues Theater come. She has to say something. And she got to say something. Yeah, I but know. you tell us who you are. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Elise. I'm the assistant producer at American Blues Theater. So I uh, read scripts for us and I make the educational materials for everything we do, which you'll get if you get your tickets to the show. You'll get emailed a link with a bunch of like an interview with Wanda Christine is on there, interviews with the director, things like that. So yeah, I do all that. So are you enjoying uh, working with this play here? Absolutely, yeah. It's We had a reading of it just for the staff for us to hear it, and we were like all close to tears. Wanda Christine broke our heart, and it was just her reading it too. So definitely one to see. So you're basically telling that this is going to be a phenomenal play. Absolutely, Okay. Yeah. And I paid her at least $10,000 to say that. I'll give you your money. Wait a minute, you could pay me five. <laughs> wait, wait a minute now. I'll go down to one fifty. <laughs> well, what I'm what I'm uh, seeing so far is that if uh, your personality, your persona, comes out in the play like it does now, it's going to be exceptional. There's uh, no play, nobody else inside and, of me. But and one me. of the things that we do at Let's Play, you know, our motto is, um, you know, we want to we want to bring people back to theater. Yes. And we want to let them know about the, you know, we call it the the uh, what is it? The gems. The hidden gems of yes. the, the Chicagoland theaters. Yes. And so we're doing that. We're trying to get people to know about the greatness of Chicagoland theaters. Before you go. Just talk to some people about why is it so important for us to participate and be a part of seeing these awesome plays that we have. First of all, this. it's important to support theater yes. because if we don't support theater, there is no theater. We know that now, right now, uh, a lot of the funding is being cut through the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, there is There are so many schools right now that do not have drama, they don't have music, um, they don't have the outlets that we had, or I had, when I was very blessed to grow up having. And like I said, my mother was very instrumental. She took me to theater as a young child. I was seeing theater at eight. My grandmother would take us to all the musical plays, and my brother and I would fight over the binoculars. <laughs> Uh, but I think it's important that if we don't support theater, if we don't support the Jackie Taylors, if we don't support the Ron O.J. Parsons and Chuck Smith and all the other theaters, the small theater companies, especially the small theater companies, because they don't have the money. Yeah. They don't have the means to get out and advertise and to say, hey, come on out and see this piece. If we don't do it by word of mouth, by going to see somebody's piece, and it's not always about seeing a black play. It's about seeing Latino piece. It's about seeing an Asian piece. It's about seeing everybody so that you know what theater is. Because if you don't know what it is, how can you say you want to be an actor? And I like that. That's very important to know what theater is. You and have to. That's one of the things that we're trying to do so much is get the people to know what theater is and, and the, the beauty of theater. And I yes. think sometimes people uh, forget about the beauty, the essence of seeing a raw play, like I said before, without any cuts. Without right. Any, you got to do it again, you know, where right. a person is really showing their, their, their full potential and talent. 
And the other thing is about it, if we support some of these wonderful uh, small theaters, mm -hmm. which have some great plays. Absolutely. I mean, you, you, you see your Hamiltons, but you've got great yes. plays yes. in some of these theaters, just yes. like, you know, I'm going to say the American Blues Theater. Yes. Uh, you're going to see a great play there, too, in uh, Beauty's Daughter. We've got to get out more to do that, and so that's our goal. And so we thank you very much uh, for being a part I wanna, of our First of all, I want to thank the two of you for picking up the... the the pen, the paper, the microphone to tell people about theater, about what's going on in Chicago. We don't have people like you, African Americans that are supporting us, that are critiquing us, that are saying, get out here. Okay, this sucks, but go see it anyway. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't matter. Everything is not great. No. But everything needs to be supported to some degree. We have to, because if we don't, how will they grow? Right. They won't grow. People won't realize that, oh, you mean I need to turn my phone off and not text while I'm in a theater? Duh. You know, we can see it from the stage. Right, uh, yeah. It does that like, is, oh, okay. <laughs> that is one in here. Yeah. That is, okay, people, that's the last thing I got to say to you. Please put your phone on vibrate and leave it in your purse or in your pocket because when an actor is on stage we can see you texting the light is on us we see you and baby i will come off that stage you know, it, would be so, it would be so funny, and it's just ab living now. It'd be so funny that if you did something like a old Carol Burnett, where you just yes. ab living, you still knew your line. You say, "Hey, I could see that phone. Would you stop?" Well, it's you know, me not to be able to do this, but I'm going to go back to my line. But Patty, I can Le see that phone. Patty Lapone just did it a couple of nights ago. Okay. Uh, she was doing Sunset Boulevard, and somebody pulled out their phone, and they was they were taking a picture, and she stopped the show to get their phone taken away from them. Now, you heard the announcement. Right, no yeah, pictures. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. You Don't heard it. The what the hell? Say. What you gonna do? <laughs> Stop it. No. Yeah. I do want to say this though, before we let you go. My takeaway with you has been so authentic and real. I love Thank everything you. that you just presented to us. That Thank you. Share with others. But what touched me the most is everything you learn you give back. Most people are so selfish with this because they're trying to be unlike, you know, the crabs in the barrel. I'm going to get to the top. But you reach back and like you said, I stopped charging. I, I want to. you to get this information for free and subject you because to those, what you have Because those babies have to work. Some of these actresses and actors that are just starting out, they're they're waitressing, or they're a nanny, or they're still going to school part-time. They don't have the money to pay somebody $350 an hour to coach them. They don't have the money for a lot of things. So why am I going to charge them something that was given to me as a gift? This is a gift. God blessed me. If I do not pass it on, who's going to pass it on to somebody else? you got to pass it on. So we're going to close. I'm going to have the young lady over here tell us again about the, the play, where it's at, what time, and when they can see it. Yeah, so the play is Beauty's Daughter by American Blues Theater at stage 773, which is at 1225 West Belmont. Uh, it opens July 7th and runs through August 5th on Thursday, Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays with a couple Mondays and Wednesdays thrown in there. You can check out AmericanBluesTheater.com for all the details. All right. Uh, Wanda, Christine, thank you very much. Thank for, you guys so much. This was there. just the best.